Um, I believe we can we can commence now. I understand that all of you must be very busy, have busy schedules, so I'd like to start on time. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, presentation of the Least Developed Countries Report 2021, which is Least Developed Countries in the Post-COVID World, learning from 50 years of experience. Now we have had uh, we've taken the, the the opportunity to invite member states who sit in Bangkok, member states who sit in New York, and member states who sit in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and member states who sit in Geneva to this event. Um, before we start, I'd like to, if everybody could mute their, their, their microphones, so we don't get any back chatter. But I'd like to commence this uh, 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 event with an opening address by His Excellency uh, Ambassador Ligoya, who is the permanent representative of Malawi to the United Nations in New York and coordinator of the group of LDCs. Ambassador Ligoya, you, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you very much, my good friend, uh, Mr. Paul Akinui, Director Division for Africa, uh, LDCs and Special Programs at UNCTAD. I want to thank you and your team uh, for this occasion uh and welcome everybody uh to this virtual event of presentation of UNCTAD's the least developed countries report 2021 the least developed countries in the post-covid world learning from 50 years of experience this report just launched is the latest in a series the organization has been publishing since the 1980s. The series regularly offers to the international community in-depth and uh, knowledgeable analysis of the development challenges of LDCs. It also presents policy options and alternatives to both LDCs themselves and to their development partners. In other words, the policy work is intended for both domestic and international policy action. UNCTAD has long been doing research work on productive capacities and pleading for this issue to be picked up by policymakers as an organizing principle for development policy. We welcome the focus of the organization on the development of productive capacities as well as the initiative to provide a measurement for this complex notion and associated processes. This has recently materialized in the launch of the Productive Capacities Index, which provides the measurement not only of productive capacities overall, but also of its constituting components. The index provides the basis for the productive capacities gap assessment, which at present starts being rolled out. Okay. Uh, I was saying the index provides the basis for the productive capacities gap assessment, which at present starts being rolled out in several of our countries, including my own Malawi. Dear friends, LDCs find themselves at a particularly critical juncture. The COVID-19 pandemic has been global in nature, but it has been particularly pernicious for LDCs. While our countries have been able to weather some of the worst health effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, our external vulnerabilities mean that we have not been able to shield our economies and societies from the most pernicious negative impacts of the pandemic. Last year, the LDCs experienced their worst economic performance in 30 years. In turn, this caused the reversal of development gains uh, so hardly won in previous years, especially in the fields of poverty, hunger, education, and health. Currently, as some parts of the world are slowly recovering from the pandemic slump, many LDCs continue to struggle 
with depressed exports, plummeting physical revenues, rising external debt, and worsening social outcomes. Unless these trends are countered effectively and immediately, the present situation might be the prelude of another lost decade in the development of most of our countries. Looking at ongoing developments, it is clear that our countries need to embark on a strong recovery from the pandemic slump. Others say we need to build back better, but I would rather say we need to build forward differently. The prevailing model of economic development and economic interdependence that we have followed so far have not served our economies adequately. This is made clear by our persistent external vulnerabilities, persistent poverty, the repeatedly unmet targets of successive programs of action, and the slow pace of LDC graduation so far. This year's the least developed countries report of UNCTAD comes at an especially critical juncture, not just because of the processes that I've just mentioned, but also in terms of policy making Ambassador, we've lost your sound. Uh, can you yeah, hear me? We can hear you now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, this year's uh, LDC report of UNCTAD comes at an especially critical juncture, not just because of the processes that I've just mentioned, but also in terms of policy making action. First, the 15th session of uh, UNCTAD will take place next week. In preparation for it, the group of LDCs held a ministerial meeting on 16th September convened by the Minister of Trade uh, from Malawi. It was held to discuss the priorities of the group for international policy making in favor of LDCs, as well as for the future work of UNCTAD on LDCs. Second, we are in the final phase of the preparatory process of LDC-5. LDCs and our development partners are intensively discussing the policy priorities for the present decade uh, to be translated in a new program of action for the LDCs for the period 2022 to 2031. It is to be adopted during the fifth United Nations Conference on LDCs to be held in Doha, Qatar in January 2022. This is a critical moment in which LDCs and their development partners are devising strategies for sustainable development in the middle term to be enacted during the 2022-2031 decade. LDCs and our development partners are negotiating the new program under especially difficult circumstances for our countries. In this situation, sound research and analysis is especially important and provides critical inputs to policymakers in their decision-making. We therefore welcome the new report of UNCTAD and hope that the analysis contained in the report, which will be presented today, can contribute to the preparatory process. I therefore look forward to hearing the findings of UNCTAD's flagship publication. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Ambassador Lodoya, for those uh, welcome remarks and, in fact, quite uh, poignant remarks that you made. Now I'd like to make some introductory remarks to the report before we go into details of the findings of the report. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, as uh, the Ambassador has mentioned, this comes at a very critical time, UNCTAD 15 and the DOOR Program of Action. 
Um, and as some of you will recall or may know that this is now 50 years since the establishment of the category of LDCs. And this has been primarily as a result of UNCTAD's research and analysis and consensus building, which resulted in the General Assembly Resolution 2626-25 in October 1970, when the category was created. Now, since then, some of the traditional symptoms of underdevelopment uh, still linger on after 50 years today. Through a variety, of, although a variety of intensity, we still have low labor productivity, high poverty rates, and low human capital formation, and technology uptake continue to be a significant challenge facing most LDCs. Too few LDCs have had significant advances when it comes to diversifying their economies and achieving structural transformation. And in fact, commodity dependence and export concentrations with a focus on only a few products remain a critical challenge for the vast majority of LDCs. As LDCs account for only 0.13% of total global trade in 2020 and play also a marginal role in the global value chains. Nevertheless, so while some LDCs have had some significant progress, notably in the social sector, health, nutrition, poverty reduction, a few have also made gains when it comes to industrialization and broadening their manufacturing capacity. However, unfortunately, these are the exceptions rather than the rule. As such, all LDCs would benefit from more targeted support technical assistance and policy guidance to shape their future development in a more inclusive and sustainable way. And this should take the form of a new generation of international support measures to help LDCs in areas of trade, finance, technology, and capacity building. Now, this report advocates for a renewed set of international principles on how best to align international support measures with the present development needs and realities of LDCs and not of those of the past. Domestic and international efforts should be focused on ensuring sustainable and balanced growth. And particular attention should be paid to balancing of growth and development across rural and urban areas and in the inclusion of vulnerable population groups such as women, indigenous groups and youth. While the current international focus is on higher growth, which is important, efforts should also focus on improving the quality of growth and its sectoral balance, as well as inclusivity and sustainability. What is important is the next generation of development policies cannot be underpinned on all development models. And in this regard, there must be a complete shift away from a commodity driven development model and a focus on and focus on upgrading low value added manufacturing, which at present locks LDCs into only marginal participation in global value chains. This approach has not enabled countries to develop their own national productive capacities sufficient to be able to achieve structural transformation and economic diversification. Dependence on one or a few primary commodities with limited transformation and value addition locks LDCs and other developing countries into low tier, in, into low tiers of global value chains and jeopardizes the upgrading and precludes the further insertion into global markets. The proposed shift away from the commodity driven growth model calls for placing productive capacities at the center of domestic policies and strategies, as well as rebalancing development finance with equal emphasis on the productive sectors of the economy. Now, the objectives of this report are threefold. First, to take stock of the major features of the growth and development experiences of LDCs over 50 years. And second, to estimate the financial needs for LDCs to reach critical SDG targets. And third, to provide policy analysis and proposals which are useful to the international community 
for the formulation and implementation of policies for the medium term. Now, this report, 2021, undertakes a novel LDC-specific LDC costing exercise of the most critical sustainable development goals and targets. Now, these include especially the targets that LDCs need to reach to achieve structural transformation and attain sustainable development. The UNCTAD approach highlights the financing needs related to undertaking structural transformation. Whereas previous exercises, which you're all familiar with, have tended to concentrate mainly on social development and infrastructure. And we go even further. Our methodology is rooted in forecasting based on elasticities that measure projected changes in investments required to achieve targeted targets, including maintaining higher growth, which is SDG 8, ending extreme poverty, SDG 1, promoting structural change, transformation, SDG 9, developing human well being, SDG 1, 3, and 4, and conserving the environment, SDG 15. And we specifically consider the role of the manufacturing sector. Other approaches to cost the financing needed to achieve the SDGs were more limited and relied only on backcasting based on previous performance or the use of input output data. Now, later on in just a few minutes, my colleague, Rolf Traeger, will provide additional findings of the estimations exercise we have undertaken. What I would like to stress though, is that now, is that the results that the investments of the investments needed for LDCs to achieve the 2030 agenda are extremely daunting. For example, if the LDCs want to eradicate extreme poverty and reach SDG target 1.1, they will need to grow at an average oh. annual rate of 9% from now until 2030. Their economies having stagnated in 2020 and projected to grow by just 2.3% this year, the required growth rate is highly unrealistic. Furthermore, to double the share of manufacturing of GDP, SDG target 9.2, they will need to grow at 20% per annum, which is far more difficult to achieve. And as such, we believe structural transformation remains the core aim of LDCs to achieve economic dynamism and resilience. The focus on building productive capacities and their corresponding capabilities is rooted in the need to steer a path to development that assures economic, social, and environmental sustainability. Mainstreaming productive capacity development in LDCs is a necessary condition for boosting their capacity to respond to and recover from crises and to advance on the pathways towards sustainable inclusive development. It is only if an alternative development path is enacted and supported by a conducive international environment that LDCs will achieve graduation with momentum. The key of this graduation strategy is to bridge the pre and post graduation development processes to create sustainable graduation and continuity in the development trajectory beyond graduation. Ladies and gentlemen, have you, as you have heard from the uh, Ambassador Ligoy, UNCTAD 15 and the Doha Program of Action, which will be held in 2020, January 2020, are critical milestones on how we can support these developed countries. And we believe that you cannot continue with business as usual and expect different results. There is a need for you to reflect, I think, on whether the outcome of the DOOR program action goes beyond business as usual or not. And we believe that if member states were willing to trust the advice of UNCTAD and research in the establishment of the LDC category some 50 years ago, I believe it is important now that you reflect on what UNCTAD's activities and advice over 50 years of research and analysis has provided in this report and embrace a new development model with productive capacity 
at the center. Now, with those few words, I thank you very much. And I'd like to ask uh, my colleague. You're muted, Paul. Sorry, I'd like to ask Rolf Traeger to present the report now in more detail. Rolf, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kiwumi. Thank you to all the presence of uh, all of you. So uh, I will present uh, in some more detail uh, the main findings of uh, the report. And so I, uh, I hope you can see the slides uh, which I'm sharing now. So as uh, was uh, mentioned, uh, the LDC category was uh, established uh, 50 years ago in exactly in November 1971. But as was uh, already alluded, some of the development challenges which led to the establishment of the LDC category still linger to this very day. So nowadays, 85% of uh, LDCs are still commodity dependent. The export structure of these countries is still uh, pretty much uh, reliant on a small number of products. And this is true even for those countries uh, which are exporters of manufacturers. And uh, if you consider both merchandise trade and services trade, the group of LDCs accounts for just 0.13% of international trade throughout the last decade. Well, over the last uh, 50 years, the number of uh, LDCs varied considerably. It started with uh, 25 countries. It reached a maximum of 52 countries in 1991, and now we are at 46 countries. So this means that uh, until nowadays, uh, only six countries have graduated out of the category, which again highlights uh, the challenge that these group of countries are facing. So now, uh, as uh, we look over these uh, 50 years of uh, growth and development experience, and uh, we uh, concentrate on the growth in GDP per capita of uh, these countries, what we see is that out of the present date 46 uh, least developed countries, half of them have fallen behind other developing countries. So. Uh, or uh, the rest of the world, both other developing countries and developed countries. What does it mean? It means that uh, income per capita of other countries which are not LDCs has grown at a significantly stronger pace than that of uh, half of the LDCs, and therefore they have fallen behind. 16 other LDCs have managed to have their GDP per capita growing at roughly the same pace as the rest of the world. And finally, it's just seven LDCs who have managed to uh, experience a growth in their GDP per capita at a considerably stronger pace than the rest of the world. And therefore, the income difference between these seven LDCs and the rest of the world has slowly narrowed over the last 50 years. And who are these uh, seven uh, LDCs? It's Bangladesh, Bhutan, Cambodia, Lao PDR, Lesotho, Mali, and Myanmar. And uh, not coincidentally, we can see that four of these seven catching up countries are uh, in the pipeline for graduation at present. On top of it, uh, the growth trajectory of these countries has been prone to boom and bust uh, cycles, which means that the growth decelerations in LDCs, that they have been much more frequent than either in other developed countries, not to mention developed countries. So what is the economic situation of LDCs at present? Well, as uh, the ambassador uh, mentioned, in terms of health, uh, the LDCs, they have uh, performed better than initially forecast, and they have been uh, able to weather some of the worst uh, direct imp health impacts of the pandemic. 
But when it comes to the indirect economic and social impacts of the COVID-19 shock, they have been hardly hit because of the low resilience of LDCs to external shocks. So this manifests itself in increasing poverty, increasing hunger, falling levels of uh, schooling, but also in terms of uh, broader macroeconomic terms, in terms of uh, reduction of investment, a large number of disappearance of companies, small and medium enterprises, micro enterprises or others, but also the increase uh, of uh, foreign debt. So uh, at present, uh, where we find ourselves is uh, at this juncture, is at the beginning of um, two-speed world recovery in which some economies are increasing and uh, in, uh, increasing their growth rhythm and recovering from uh, the COVID slump. But not all countries are capable of, uh, of joining this, uh, of experiencing the same uh, growth momentum. And uh, this includes particularly many of the LDCs. And therefore, the result of this uh, is uh, likely to increase world inequality. And the beginning of this, uh, we have uh, already experienced since last year, but I mean, this is a trend uh, which is likely or can potentially in any case continue in the coming years. So we also beyond uh, the growth uh, experience of uh, the last 50 years, we uh, have also uh, examined the experience of the four programs of action which the international community has adopted for the LDCs ever since 1981. And first of all, uh, what you can see is that the focus uh, and uh, the attention in terms of issues and priorities which are enshrined in these uh, uh, programs of action is something which uh, has been changing uh, over the last 40 years according to uh, changing development thinking. So for instance, if you, you look at the Paris uh, Program of Action, which was adopted in uh, 1991, uh, the focus was on poverty and social development alongside with development thinking of the late 1980s and early 1990s. Whereas the Brussels Program of Action uh, confirmed this uh, thinking which had emerged already earlier of export orientation and openness as the road to development. Finally, when you examine the latest uh, program of action, which is the Istanbul program of action adopted in 2011, you can see that it has much broader targets. It includes graduation, but uh, it contemplates also social development, uh, economic development, some issues of technology. So what you can see along uh, these different programs of action is that the scope of action, the scope of objectives of these uh, programs of action has been broadening. And the consequence uh, of this uh, is that uh, the demands on uh, state uh, capacity have been increasing because you have a broadening field of areas, issues and targets which have been adopted and which the LDCs are supposed to implement. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that the dominant uh, economic model has tended to weaken state capacity in LDCs, particularly since the beginning of the structural adjustment programs back in the 1980s and 1990s. But even uh, nowadays, uh, the way, for instance, in which uh, uh, aid is delivering is something which does not strengthen the state capacity, it does not reverse this long-term weak of state capacities and uh, because of low allocations of ODA to budget support, rather it's typically done uh, through parallel structures, but also uh, in parallel to that uh, you have uh, the low tax revenue as a share of GDP in uh, LDCs, uh, which uh, limits considerably the, the fiscal space and the policy space of these countries. 
Now, looking forward, as uh, was mentioned earlier, the report uh, tries uh, to make an estimate uh, of the cost of reaching some uh, major uh, targets uh, selected from the Sustainable Development Goals. And as uh, was already mentioned, uh, in uh, adopting one type of methodology, we have uh, selected these uh, three SDG targets. It's the 7% uh, growth target target. It's the target of eradicating extreme poverty. That's the very first, not only of the SDGs, but the very first target of the first SDG. And finally, industrialization, which we have proxied by uh, the doubling of the share of manufacturing in uh, GDP. And so uh, these are the dimensions uh, of uh, the annual investment requirement to reach these targets. So it's upwards of $150 billion of uh, annual investment over the next 10 years for the first two targets. Are you reaching uh, the economic growth rate of 7% over 10 years or eradicating extreme poverty? However, when it comes to industrialization, to doubling the share of uh, manufacturing in GDP, the investment requirements are much, much higher. They are of the order of $1 trillion of investment uh, every single year over the, nine, over the next uh, 10 years. So this gives a very uh, strong idea of the size of the challenge, uh, of the very tall challenge, uh, which uh, LDCs are expected to accomplish uh, within the SDGs, but also of the requirements uh, that this uh, poses in terms of uh, in terms of investment. And just to give you an idea, even the lowest of these figures is more than 50% higher than what all of the LDCs invested back in 2019 before the outbreak of the crisis. And as uh, was mentioned, if you go uh, to the, the most uh, ambitious of these uh, objectives, which is that of industrialization, which again, we adopted as a proxy for structural transformation, this uh, would uh, entail that these economies would need to grow by a whopping rate of 20% every single year over the next 10 years. Now, as uh, was again mentioned uh, by the director, we also uh, provide an LDC specific estimate of the costs of reaching some selected uh, social goals. And what are these? They are the universalization of health services, the universalization of education services, universalization of social protection, but also biodiversity converse, uh, conservation. And uh, we compare to what LDCs uh, actually spend uh, in these areas. And that's how we arrive at the financing gaps. And as you can see by the figures there, these gaps are extremely high, particularly if you look at social protection. It means that LDCs would need to raise their spending on social protection by 21% uh, of GDP. So all in all, if you uh, put uh, these uh, gaps together, it would mean that the LDCs will need to spend more than 40% of their GDP to meet these goals. And this will simply mean that LDCs would need to spend as a proportion of their GDP as much as OECD countries do at present. So this again gives an idea of the daunting tasks ahead for LDCs, but also for the international community. So based on this uh, diagnostic that we do, both of uh, the, la the growth experience of the last 50 years, of the implementation of four different programs of action, but also of the cost uh, that it would take to implement uh, the SDGs, uh, what, uh, what are the proposals that the uh, report uh, makes uh, in terms of looking towards uh, the future development models, the future development trajectories of, uh, of the LDCs?
And here we uh, reaffirm uh, what uh, we have already been saying that uh, the central focus of development trajectories of LDCs needs to be the development of productive capacities. What exactly do we mean by productive capacities? Well, uh, it's uh, this, uh, this complex web uh, of uh, economic actors uh, and activities, which is made up of first productive resources like physical capital, natural capital, machinery, the second component are entrepreneurial capabilities, uh, which comprise both uh, enterprise capabilities, and, but also critically technological capabilities of the enterprises of LDCs. And finally, the last component of productive capacities are the production linkages between economic agents, between large and small companies, between the rural and the urban economy, and finally and critically between the national economy and the international economy. So all of this means that focusing on the development of productive capacities, uh, if uh, successfully undertaken, this results in the structural transformation of uh, the economy of uh, LDCs. And uh, what uh, does uh, this entail? Well, this uh, means that uh, there needs to be a shift of labor, uh, the shift of human power, but also of capital, of productive resources from low productivity activities to high productivity activities. And what will this entail? Well, this will uh, entail higher labor productivity, hence higher labor earnings, uh, and uh, eventually the eradication of poverty, but also internationally stronger international uh, competitiveness. And so uh, domestically, uh, if this strategy is uh, followed, this will uh, uh, result uh, in building the resilience of, uh, of LDC economies uh, to external shocks. As I said at the beginning of uh, this uh, presentation, the fact that uh, even though the health shock was not as strong as initially feared in LDCs, but uh, the economic and social consequences have hit them very hard together with the fact that they have less resources uh, to implement uh, countervailing measures and policy measures means that uh, they are mired in the present crisis and in the COVID shock. So to build uh, this resilience, uh, it's uh, uh, important and indispensable for these countries to strengthen their productive sector and to build a much stronger and denser web of uh, enterprises compri comprising all sorts of enterprises, both micro, small, medium, and uh, medium-sized enterprises, but also larger enterprises. And this applies to all sectors, be it agriculture, be it industry, be it services. And this will result uh, in the creation of uh, inclusive growth and in job creation and the creation of uh, jobs of high quality, which is the long-term solution for the problem of poverty. And this, of course, uh, uh, requires on the other side, uh, uh, having a more strategic view of the building of human capacity, because for you to have technological upgrading, for you to have this shift uh, of the labor force from low productivity activities to high productivity activities, you need to have a much better trained uh, uh, labor force, which has uh, much higher skills. And so this uh, means uh, that uh, this requires the uh, orientation of domestic policies, first of all, towards the development of productive capacities, aiming at the structural transformation of uh, these economies. But this needs to be backed by international policies and uh, by the backing of LDC development partners to their domestic policies and to their domestic development objectives. 
and among uh, among uh, domestic policies uh, industrial policy has a fundamental role to play uh, because uh, it aims uh, at uh, structural transformation at increasing the value added of economic activities in all sectors uh, and uh, it aims at uh, incorporation of more modern more performing uh, technologies and particularly the most recent waves of uh, technological uh, innovation digital technologies but uh, as i mentioned earlier creating decent jobs and increasing the earnings of uh, the population but again, and I, I come back uh, to what uh, something which I have alluded to earlier, it is uh, the fact that in order to adopt uh, these industrial policy, in order to implement uh, these set of policies, which will result in the structural transformation of the economy, this once again requires state capacity. State capacity to uh, formulate development strategies, to design and implement development policies, but also to bring coherence into the actions of different types of economic actors, be they domestic companies, international companies, the private sector, the public sector, etc. And uh, to develop state capacity, again, LDCs also need uh, the backing of their development partners. And going to ISMs, uh, these are the international support measures uh, which uh, the international community and the development partners of LDCs have been implementing in favor of LDCs to boost uh, their uh, development, particularly in the fields uh, of uh, trade, uh, of finance, of technology, and of capacity building. So what we have seen is that uh, the present day ISMs, they have had a positive impact uh, in the development outcomes of the LDCs, but uh, they have clearly been uh, insufficient because of a series of uh, institutional uh, shortcomings uh, uh, as uh, they have been put in place. Uh, they have not always been coherent. Financing has not always been present, uh, et cetera. So for the new decade, what LDCs need uh, is a new generation of uh, international support measures, which are coherent amongst themselves, which uh, allows the creation of these different of synergy between these different ISMs, which are uh, effective, which are transparent and mutually accountable between LDCs and their development partners, uh, and uh, which are consistent with new realities like uh, digitalization, climate change and the restructuring of global uh, value chains, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. So turning towards uh, some of these uh, crucial uh, ISMs, it's very important that the international community preserves uh, the principle of special land differential treatment at the multilateral sphere, in the case of uh, trade uh, in the WTO agreement, where this uh, periodically comes uh, into question. So it's important to preserve the special differential treatment for LDCs, not only in present uh, agreements, but also in future agreements. And of course, related to this, there is the whole discussion of graduation and of possible transition periods for these uh, uh, SDT measures. In terms of uh, bilateral market access, uh, even though uh, this is something which uh, has improved considerably over the last 10 to 15 years, and some of the most successful LDCs have been able to leverage uh, these preferential market access to develop their manufacturing sector. And this uh, certainly has been very positive, but I mean, there are still issues remaining in terms of the implementation of DFQF, duty-free, quota-free, uh, free trade access to markets, and particularly in terms of the rules of origin with which uh, LDC producers have to comply in order to be able to benefit of these preferential market in uh, major uh, target markets, export markets. 
but also it's important that uh, LDCs leverage uh, opportunities from regional and sub-regional uh, integration. We know that several LDCs uh, are uh, active uh, and are part of important regional uh, trade agreements. In the case of RCEP in Southeast Asia, in the case of Africa, it's of course the case of AFCFTA, the Continental Free Trade Area. And this opens opportunities for LDCs, uh, which they can exploit in the field of uh, international trade. Second, I'd like uh, to mention the area of financing for development. We need to recognize that there is a room for progress in terms of domestic resource mobilization on the side of uh, LDCs. We know that most LDCs collect in terms of taxes uh, around 15% of GDP, which is extremely low. So you need to have uh, an enhancement of their fiscal uh, capacity, of the effectiveness of spending, uh, et cetera, which by the way is an important co component of building of state capacities. But in view of the very stark financing requirements that the SDGs pose to LDCs, and which I have mentioned, we know that uh, domestic resource uh, mobilization will not be enough. Hence, uh, the very strong need for support from external sources of uh, financing, starting with ODA and uh, FTI. That's why it's important that bilateral donors comply with their commitments in terms of both quantity and quality of ODA towards uh, LDCs. Remember, there is the 0.15 to 0.20% of donor country GNI, which is to be allocated to ODA, to least developed uh, countries. And uh, recently, uh, there has been uh, the decision by the IMF uh, to undertake the new emission of SDR, special drawing rights, uh, to the tune of $650 billion. What's the problem of this? Well, the problem of this is that uh, unless there is a reallocation of, this, of these liquidities in favor of LDCs, they, uh, have, they will uh, have only a very minor part of it uh, to the tune of $15 billion. And remember, even the lowest of the investment requirements, uh, which we have estimated, are to the tune of $460 billion. So, I mean, these $15 uh, billion pale in comparison to the investment requirements of LDCs. Hence, the need to significantly reallocate this new liquidity from other countries who are in a comfortable external position towards LDCs. And finally, I'd like to mention uh, blended finance, which is regularly uh, mentioned in international policy circles. And uh, in some cases, uh, it uh, seems to be presented as the solution to all the, to all the financing requirements of developing countries, including of uh, LDCs. But as uh, we have uh, analyzed, there are all sorts of issues with blended finance, particularly in the context of uh, LDCs, of potential contingent uh, liabilities, of lack of transparency, of where the public money or of where the ODA money is going and who is benefiting from this money. And particularly, there are issues on uh, to what extent the domestic enterprise sector and LDCs benefits from these uh, operations. So we he need to be very careful when we are discussing blended finance. And finally, I'd like uh, to mention the needs of LDCs uh, in terms of technology. Uh, remember that I mentioned that one of the pillars of um, productive capacities is uh, entrepreneurial capacities, 
which include the technological payment capabilities of the companies, uh, of the enterprises, the firms of LDCs. And there's a huge, huge need of technological upgrading of the firms operating in LDCs, particularly the domestic national firms, again, whether they are operating in industry or agriculture or services. And this can be done through different mechanisms, for instance, through the effective implementation of Article 66.2 uh, of the TRIPS agreement, and also um, by the implementation of LDC investment regimes, uh, which are foreseen in STD, SDG target 17.5. These uh, regimes should include uh, the strengthening of technological capabilities of domestic uh, companies, uh, but also uh, when you have ODA-backed private sector instruments, uh, these are another occasion the, uh, in which, uh, or these are other occasions in which uh, the obligation or uh, incentives to transfer technology to LDC companies can be enacted. And similarly, when the corporate social responsibility is being enacted by private companies, this is a very good occasion in which companies can adopt transfer of technology to LDCs as part of uh, their commitments. Also, in the case of uh, climate change discussions, uh, there has been a traditional uh, discussion on transfer of technologies, and we know that uh, the climate change crisis, uh, crisis uh, is deepening, and the LDCs uh, uh, are the country's least, uh, least um, uh, prepared to weather them. So it's important not only to increase the uh, climate financing, but also to strengthen the transfer of technology component uh, of these policies. And finally, and similar to, uh, similar to what I have mentioned in the case of trade, there are also opportunities for transfer of technology towards LDC companies uh, in the context of regional and sub-regional integration initiatives. So ISMs, uh, they need to be pursued, upgraded uh, in all of these fields, and particularly the coherence among them needs to be ensured by the international community. And I would just like uh, to finish by informing you that, uh, as was mentioned, the report was launched yesterday. So uh, as from today, it is available on our website and can be consulted and downloaded there. So I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, th th thank you very much, Rolf, indeed, and, and uh, I would like to uh, also congratulate Rolf and his team for an excellent report, which I believe can make a significant contribution to UNCTAD deliverables in UNCTAD 15 and also the DOA program of action. So thank you very much indeed, and also for the presentation. Now, I would we have uh, uh, about 10 or 15 minutes where we would like to open the floor to anybody who would like to make any comments or ask any questions uh, uh, before we, we, we wrap up the session. So I'd like to open the floor. I think you, you, you can, you can uh, raise your hand electronically or, or you can also do it physically and I'll see you. And, uh, and if you have any questions or any comments that you would like to make. So I'd like to open the floor now. Is there anybody who'd like to to make some comments or uh, ask some questions. Perhaps, um, perhaps uh, whilst you're all thinking of something, I can ask uh, my, my colleague Rolf, because he, he clearly indicated to us how the program of action has evolved over time, depending on the thrust and the uh, fashion of the particular time and place and time in history. And he also mentioned how it's slowly moving. It was socially and slowly moving to uh, getting broader and broader. And this had an impact on very much on the government's capacity. And uh, um, I'd like to ask him from your research and analysis of what you've discovered. I think there's a next step. What, 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 what the DOA program of action, uh, what do you envisage the DOA program of action to folk should focus on in order for us to have more coherence in order to us to have more of an impact 
on achieving structural transformation. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Akiwumi. So, I mean, as was mentioned by the ambassador, the Dohan uh, program of action is being negotiated as we speak. And uh, from what uh, it sounds as uh, it's going uh, to happen, it uh, is very likely that it will have a very broad scope. I mean, so uh, it's very likely to continue this trend of having broader scope, a wider set of objectives and targets, which encompass, yes, economic uh, goals of growth, uh, of technological upgrading, etc., but also social uh, goals in terms of health, uh, uh, education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, it is uh, very likely that uh, the goals will be there, the objectives will be there, but then, uh, of course, uh, the real issue is uh, the means of implementation. What are the conditions which are made available to least developed countries to, for the pursuit of these goals? And as our uh, analysis has just shown in this year's report, uh, uh, quite frequently you have a very ambitious goals which are adopted by the international uh, community, including LDCs and their development uh, partners. It's the case of Agenda 2030, it's the case of SDGs, but the means of implementation, particularly in terms of institutional mechanisms, in terms of, uh, uh, of financing, in terms of putting in place domestic institutional capabilities are missing. So, I mean, this is uh, the plea of ANTA to the international uh, community. Yes, I mean, the ambitious goals are very important. We already have the SDGs, which are extremely ambitious, and they are very worthy goals, and the whole world is in the pursuit of them. But, I mean, the means of implementation, providing the countries with the conditions to reach them is also very important. And uh, this includes both the strengthening of domestic institutional uh, capacities, state capacities, capacities of the private sector, of the enterprise sector, but also equally crucial is the creation of an international environment which is conducive to the development of these countries and to the adoption of these new types of policies and to the adoption of this new orientation of development policies by the weakest economies of the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have a hand up. Uh, Ambassador Ligoria, you, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much and thank you, Rob, for uh, the presentation. Uh, very sensitive. Uh, I, I want to mention uh, or repeat what you have said. What is important in the next program of action is uh, the implementation. We have uh, all the areas that you have mentioned, and we know that uh, it will be very difficult to get to the amounts that you have mentioned as uh, needed for investment. My question is, you have uh, uh, mentioned about blended finance. So far, we know that only 6% of blended finance uh, goes to LDCs. And then uh, you propose the need for ODA-backed uh, schemes of a blended finance. Could you expound on this, how this would work? And uh, the uh, low blended finance going to LDCs is because of the perception of the investors, uh, perception of high risk in LDCs uh, is a perception. It's not always true. How, how do we counter this and uh, make the investors know that uh, there is money to be made in, in LDCs uh, because uh, the, the need to invest in so many areas uh, is there? 
uh, how do you see us making progress uh, in uh, uh, attracting more blended finance? I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, Rolf, can you go ahead? And yes. Thank you very much for this uh, very relevant and crucially relevant question, uh, Ms. Ambassador. And uh, this is one of the major challenges uh, concerning uh, financing for development in the case of uh, LDCs going forward. As you rightly said, only 6% of blended finance operations uh, take place in LDCs, which means that uh, its contribution to closing the external financing gap of LDCs has been uh, absolutely minor for the time being. But there are also other types of issues, particularly in terms of uh, transparency, of who takes the decision. Is it donor country who takes uh, the decision? Is it donor countries in consultation with LDCs who take uh, the decision? And uh, quite often there is a lack of transparency uh, surrounding these uh, operations because uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, commercial secrecy is quite uh, often involved uh, since these uh, involves uh, private sector operators, typically foreign uh, operators, foreign uh, operators investing in LDCs. So the extent to which they are being uh, subsidized by ODA is not uh, made clear. But I mean, crucially, the effects of this uh, in terms of the development of local productive capacities in LDCs is not uh, clear either. So, I mean, the ambassador mentioned the need uh, to attract more uh, investment as part of the mobilization of external resources to close this huge, gigantic uh, financing gap of uh, LDCs. So, um, uh, this is part of the response uh, to the mobilization of external finances, but I mean, it's something which needs to be uh, mobilized uh, in a clever way. It needs to be mobilized in the context of the country's uh, um, development uh, strategies. So I think that, uh, yes, uh, there are problems of uh, credibility. There is a problem of risk perception by para private investors uh, on uh, the risks of investing in LDCs. So, I mean, there, there is an issue of communication there. There is an issue of uh, investment promotion there. And the uh, uh, investment needs to be made uh, into this. But uh, particularly, it's important uh, that uh, these countries, that LDCs, achieve policy credibility. And policy credibility not only vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their domestic um, um, economic agents, but also vis-a-vis -vis international economic agents, both uh, public and private, i.e. private investors, but also partner countries of LDCs. So once this policy credibility, coherence, which uh, springs from having clear objectives, having a clear set of uh, coherent policies, industrial policy, trade policy, science technology policy, et cetera, et cetera, investment policy, which is education policy, which is put in place. This is something which is bound to reduce the risk perception by foreign, uh, by foreign investors. But beyond that, it's very important that um, uh, capturing foreign direct investment should not be done for the sake of capturing foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment, FDI, does have a, a role to play, but it has a role to play provided it is inserted into the country's national development goals and its mid to long term development objectives. So this applies, uh, first of all, in terms of sectors uh, to which attraction it is more important, whether it's telecommunication, whether it's agriculture, whether it's industry or whatever, doesn't matter. But this has to be determined in the context of national development goals. So that's where countries will determine where it's most important uh, to attract FDI. 
But then it's not just a matter of attracting FTI, it's a matter of making the most of FTI. This means uh, maximizing the linkages between uh, foreign companies and domestic companies. Uh, this means uh, creating, uh, negotiating with foreign investors uh, uh, and providing incentives for them to create forward and backward linkages with uh, domestic uh, companies, but at the same time, making sure that there is a certain number of domestic companies which do have uh, the technological capabilities to meet the quality standards of these international companies, etc. And so this is one of the many ways to ensure that there is a transfer of technology from these foreign operators to domestic operators. And this can slowly percolate through the rest of the economic tissue of the country. So yes, it's important to attract more FDI for a question uh, in, in order to increase the financing for development available to these countries, but it's not just a question of financing, it's also a question of strengthening the productive capacities of uh, domestic companies, of creating more companies, companies with higher technological capabilities. So FDI uh, policy, the policy to attract foreign direct investors through publicity, through uh, roadshows, etc., is important, but it's just as important that this is coherent and uh, with uh, domestic policies and that these FDI policies are part and parcel of the development policies being enacted domestically. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Rolf, for a very thorough uh, uh, answer, response. I'd, I'd also like to add that I think it's very important that it must be an overall government policy to change this narrative. That means everybody in government must understand what policies are put in place, what institutions are in place, so that they can speak with the same language that there are, the risk is minimal in that country. So it has to be an overall government policy to strive to change that narrative. I think that's critical as well. Okay, um, I'd like to open the floor again. Are there any comments or questions from anybody of the participants that you'd like to raise, speak to, or inform us? of any issues? I don't see any. Um, I'd like to just say that, uh, that um, I, I, once again, I think this come at a critical time, this report. I think it's important that uh, member states try and digest this as soon as possible so that it can help them with their negotiations with the DOA program of action and also UNCTAD 15. Um, and I think it's critical that member states understand the importance of productive capacities. It's critical that member states understand the importance of productive capacities in, in, in the context of government capacity as well, not just firm capacity, so that they may have a more focused program. Uh, uh, Ambassador Ligoy, you have your hand up again. Yeah, Thanks, just to thank you, uh, Paul, and your team uh, for this uh, uh, report, uh, it's a flagship report, and uh, hearing uh, Rolf bringing out uh, the figures, uh, we see that we have a lot of work to do, and uh, UNCTAD has a very, very specific role to play uh, in helping us LDCs uh, not only to come up with a realistic and uh, ambitious uh, program of action, but in the implementation. And that's what Rolf has said. I think in the past, we had this uh, program of actions, uh, but maybe our follow-up uh, uh, on implementation in different countries uh, was not uh, uh, well pronounced. We have the VNRs uh, from countries, uh, but you see 15 minutes presentation of uh, uh, VNR is not adequate uh, to spell out all uh, uh, problems that we are uh, facing uh, in different sectors of the economy. So I welcome UNCTAD 
as uh, one of our major uh, 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 agencies that we work with uh, to continue uh, with the good work you have uh, in uh, our countries uh, to do this uh, analysis of productive capacities gap assessment. And I'm very thankful that uh, you have uh, started with my own country as one of the uh, countries to, to benefit uh, from your expertise. Uh, I thank you and I see that we were more than 60 participants, uh, much more uh, than uh, I, I, I expected. And uh, it shows the interest that we all have in the work uh, of Ankhted. I thank you so much. Thank, uh, thank, you. Th th thank you very much, Ambassador. Most appreciated. And indeed, we will be working on the productive capacity gap assessment at the national level. We're also looking at productive capacities at the sub regional level, at the uh, regional integration level, and also within countries uh, to, to compare rural and urban areas. So we have an extensive program on that, which we feel would assist countries in, in, in targeting their policies more adequately and where they need the capacities to move forward to achieve structural transformation. So I, I want to give one last opportunity. If there are any comments or questions to be made, please raise your hands. If not, I'd, uh, we are very uh, uh, um, honored also to have with us uh, to to, to close this session, uh, His Excellency Mr. Rahman, who is the permanent representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva. So uh, Your Excellency, you, you have the floor, you, you have the last word, so to speak, and the floor as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Akumia. Um, Ambassador Park uh, Nigoya, Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank all attendees for the participation in this virtual event. My sincere appreciation goes to Antart for uh, presenting this year's uh, report, especially to both Paul and Rolf for an exhaustive presentation it was quite enlightening. Um, I would use the word um, abbreviated from LDCR because it's for, for ease of my repeated use. Indeed, uh, the report titled The Least Developed Countries in the Post COVID World Learning from 50 Years of Experience is uh, yet another example of the commitment of UNCTAD to the indices. The latest issue of LDCR carries forward its almost 40 year old legacy of solid policy relevant research and analysis on LDCs. The LDCs need this type of policy relevant research, especially in the present juncture. And I would agree also with Ambassador Liguya when he said that we also need to um, see the implementation of the policy recommendations. I cannot agree more with the speakers that uh, LDCs continue to face structural impediments to development. With the advent of COVID-19 pandemic, their vulnerabilities have come to the surface more and more. Along with the pre-existing challenges, the far-reaching impacts of the pandemic are likely to exacerbate their condition, as well as hamper their advancement in going forward. While LDCs are making efforts to overcome the obstacles lying on their path to development, international cooperation is absolutely essential for the LDCs to attain their development goals. The development partners must take into cognizance the efforts of the pandemic on LDCs. And I would also like to emphasize that uh, um, um, the graduation of LDCs is the collective aspiration of all LDCs. It is an important uh, milestone 
in the development trajectory of these countries. It is uh, encouraging that a growing number of them um, is embarking on the path to graduation. However, graduation must take place with momentum so that it does not disrupt the pace of development the country has pursued. A graduated country should not be penalized through the abrupt discontinuation of their least specific support measures. It should be hailed as an achievement by the international community. We cannot say for certain that when the pandemic will come to an end and how long it will take to build back better. There must be a wider recognition that these uncertain times, the process and prospect of LDC graduation is even more challenging. I'm happy to see that the LDC report has reflected these concerns and presented lessons learned from the pandemic. It puts forward several ideas, principles, and proposals. I'm confident that these will be useful inputs to the preparatory process of LDC-5. Therefore, these will serve as significant guidance for both the LDC governments and their development partners to proceed with their development plans during the decade 2022 to 2031. Dear colleagues, we agree with the diagnosis, diagnostic of the LDC report that structural economic transformation is a necessary condition for LDCs to achieve their SDGs. Efforts for structural economic transformation must be continued under the new program of action for the LDCs. The LDC report has rightly highlighted the difficulties that the LDCs face in achieving structural transformation. One of the findings of the report, which was especially striking to me, is the magnitude of investment required to achieve critical economic targets, especially structural transformation, and the extent of spending to attain major social and environmental goals. These financing requirements highlight the importance of measures and processes aiming at increasing the availability of financing for development in LDCs. And I would like to draw your attention to the following three points. First, recently there has been an emission of, uh, I think, uh, 650 billion US dollar special drawing rights by IMF. A meaningful mechanism for the transfer of liquidity to the LDCs needs to be enacted so that this initiative provides a major boost to development efforts of LDCs. There must be concrete measures in this direction for a significant surge in the external financing for our development. Second, official development assistance plays a critical role in closing the external financing gap of our countries. We cannot deny the LDC's considerable reliance on ODA for their external financing. Therefore, it is important that financing efforts mobilized last year to counter the immediate effects of the COVID-19 pandemic are sustained. Also, these must be complemented by financing of the development of productive capacities for our countries. Third, it is critical or crucial to bring more transparency to decision-making and resource allocation in blended finance operations. I think this issue was captured in the presentation of the speakers before. So far, this modality of financing has not benefiting, benefited LDCs to the extent as claimed by its supporters. Ways need to be explored to address the challenges of blended finance in the LDCs. The commitment of the international community to leave no one behind in achieving the SDGs will be demonstrated by their facilitation of resources for the development of the LDCs. In a post-COVID world, the sustenance of support is even more fundamental. The LDC reports call for a new generation of international support measures in favor of LDCs has caught my attention. These six inter alia ODA to go well beyond traditional ideas attached to it. Critically, 
It pleads for greater coherence among the ISMs in the field of finance, trade, capacity building, and technology, as well as health. I would like to stress that new initiatives in the field of ISMs also need to address the special circumstances of the graduating LPCs. New mechanisms have to be devised and enacted, which ensure that LDCs graduate with momentum and don't suffer development setbacks upon the exit from the LDC category. And colleagues, we are aware that the LDC group is pursuing a draft decision at the WTO General Council to extend LDC specific exemption and SNDTs to all LDCs for a few more years after their graduation. And I reiterate that to ensure sustainable support for the LDCs after graduation, a robust action by the international community is vital. After the close of the LDC-5 conference, the LDCs would require the support of UNTAR for the implementation of the new program of action, and more broadly, for the formulation and implementation of sustainable development policies in the present decade. Lessons learned from the 50 years of experience as presented in the LDC report would benefit both the LDCs and UNTAR to chart the course to more effective collaboration. And I look forward to the continued partnership between the LDCs and UNTAR. With these thoughts, may I bring the event to a close with all your permission. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. very much indeed, Ambassador. And uh, thank you very much indeed to the two ambassadors who've been champions for LDCs for a long time and uh, are driving this agenda forward. And uh, we believe that this is the time to make uh, the real difference in these two major conferences. And we look forward to supporting you, all LDCs in any way. And we, the document, as uh, Ralph mentioned, is available online. If you want hard copies, they'll be circulated to, to missions here in Geneva and eventually in New York and Addis Ababa as well. So thank you all very much. Have an excellent uh, rest of the evening, morning, or or afternoon. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.